Zipper rolls out to the right, pitches off to Taylor, and Taylor's to the 20. Down to the 15, down to 10, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Touchdown, Billy Taylor! Touchdown, Billy Taylor! Billy Taylor scored a touchdown from 21 yards out. The crowd goes berserk. It was November 22nd, 1969 that they came to Barry, Michigan, all dressed in maize and blue. The words were said, the prayers were read, and everybody cried. But when they closed the coffin, there was someone else inside. Oh, they came to Barry, Michigan, but Michigan wasn't dead. And when the game was over, it was someone else instead. Eleven Michigan Wolverines put on the gloves of gray, and as the organ played the victors, they laid Woody Hayes away. Under center is Wangler at the 45. He goes back. He's looking for a receiver. He throws downfield to fire. Fire! Who's got it better than us? Nobody! Welcome to the Michigan Man Podcast on Wolverine Sports Radio, a member of the V-Sporto Network and in partnership with SB Nation's Maze and Brew for Wolverine fans from coast to coast. Go Blue and welcome to the Maryland Visitors Edition of the show. I'm your host, Mike Fitzpatrick. Joining us again this year is one of our favorite guests, Maryland play-by-play voice Johnny Holiday, who has been the voice of the Terps for 44 years. He's a great guy, and as always, I'm sure you'll enjoy hearing from him. Before Johnny jumps on, here are a few of my thoughts to get us started. I've enjoyed the first three games. I know you have the preseason, if you will. But now I'm ready for the main course. I know you are too, the Big Ten schedule. Like so many of you, I know we have boatloads of talent on both sides of the ball, but given the first three opponents, it's really impossible to know just how good we are. That's okay. This week it gets real. Maryland comes to town 3-0. They have a very talented offense and a quarterback who is destined to play on Sundays. No one questions that. The Terps' defense has improved too, but they still have issues. That said, this is the first real test for us. A serious one. Our defense will face an attack this week that can be balanced, and Maryland couldn't always say that over the last few years. They would rather sling the ball all over the field, but the ground game they bring is something we cannot overlook. This is a very good offense. The goal for Mike Lockley has been to improve the defense this year. It has been their Achilles heel throughout his tenure. When they win, the games are usually shootouts. He knows the defense does not have to be lights out, but it has to be better if they want to compete against the upper echelon Big Ten teams. My guest today says this, if Maryland plays like they have the first three games, they will get hammered on Saturday in the big house. They have to improve in every aspect of the game and quickly if they are going to give themselves a chance on Saturday. Joining me next is the Football Hall of Fame voice of the Terps, Johnny Holiday. So stay with us. on our visitors edition this week is the legendary voice of Maryland football and basketball and great to have him back again Johnny Holiday. Mike it's good to be with you as always. Well we've been doing this for a few years Johnny my listeners love hearing from you we love playing Maryland I got to see the whole game on on Saturday night this is uh, I think the second year in a row Maryland started out three and oh uh, beat an SMU team in a really a wild game on Saturday night uh, the kind you see early in the season 34 27 so all in all it's been a pretty nice start uh, for Coach Loxley and the guys, hasn't it? Yeah, and I, I think it's probably the same thing, Mike, that, that Michigan's getting. You know, I see, you know, blurbs here or there 
say, well, Michigan hasn't played anybody. Maryland hasn't played anybody. Well, they played SMU, and that's the toughest test that they've had so far. And as you, you're right, they started off 3-0 last year, 3-0 this year. And But I've said this over and over again, the division we are in with you guys in Ohio State and Indiana and and Michigan State and Penn State, it's, it's just – it's just murderer's row. And you've got to be at your very best every single game. I think the SMU game, as you just mentioned moments ago, I thought it was going to be maybe a 65-61 to 61 game at the end because both quarterbacks have done so well and they're so electric and so capable of putting up 300, 350 yards a game, three touchdowns, four touchdowns. But SMU gave these guys all they could handle and the one thing with Maryland's offense is they got to cut down on the penalty and the mm-hmm. defense. Fifteen penalties is unacceptable. Uh, they had eight in the first game against Buffalo. They had eight in the second game against Charlotte. They had 15. I think the school record's 19, set way back in 1951 or somewhere back in that era. But that's been the biggest problem. They're, they're shooting themselves in the foot, and Mike Loxley continues to preach over and over and over. Guys, we're beating ourselves. And offsides, illegal motion on third down and maybe a yard or less than five yards on every single third down, somebody moves up front. And unfortunately, the left guard had the first two penalties called on him. They take the left guard out. They bring it. They got the guy from the backup right guard spot, move him to left guard. Boom. Yellow flag is dropped on left guard. It's the same, in a different, it's the guy filling in for you. <laughs> so it's just basically, basically concentration on what they're doing. And then carrying through with execution, Mike says, we never look at the opponent. We're not awed by who we're playing. It's if we play the way we play, that's all I'm concerned about. I'm not concerned about anything else. If we play our game, we'll be in every single game. If we don't, we're going to get our clock cleaned, and you better be at your best to play Michigan. Or it's going to be a long, long afternoon. Well, another good thing about uh, the game, I know I, I was right there with you, Johnny. I thought this is going to be one of those games, uh, you know, Maryland's going to put up 60 points on them. And it was, it was was that was not the case. So what it ended up being was a really good early season test. A game that featured five lead changes, three ties. Until um, uh, Talo Tagalo, and here we go. One of these days I'm going to get his name right. As much as I, the, the brothers have been along, I still don't get it right. But uh, Tag of a lawyer. Yeah, you, here's, here's what you do, Mike. I, I asked him. I said, the first year he came here, I said, okay, you got to help me with this, okay? It looks like K- Kego Veloa. He <laughs> says, Talu- Talua, okay, I go, Talua, Talia Tongavaloa. 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 He said, Mr. Holiday, you say it quickly, nobody knows the difference. <laughs> Well, he's such a good-looking quarterback. I mean, uh, and he's, and he's he's as humble as any quarterback I think I've ever worked with in Maryland in 44 years. He's got the whole package. It's team, team, team. It's nothing about Talia. It's all about the team with this kid. Watching the, some of the first two games and watching him last year, I thought, hey, this against SMU, they're going to sling the ball around, and uh, Talia's going to throw 35, 40 times. I think he was 17 for 23. And a lot of that, I know SMU's time of possession was uh, pretty impressive in that game, but one of the key performances uh, to me in that game that surprised me was Roman Hemby. In the running game, he ran for a career-high 151 yards, 213 total yards in the game with one TD. He turned in a really solid performance at running back, didn't he? Yeah, he's, he's, and he's also a good kid. These are all, every running back they have are all young guys. Hemby's only, he's a redshirt freshman and probably has the best speed of any of the th- four guys that they alternate at that running back spot. But he had a couple of touchdowns earlier in the season. He was the leading rusher coming into the game. Uh, six feet, goes about 200 pounds. He's up there from Bel Air, Maryland, just north of Baltimore. Then the backup guy he's got, Colby McDonald, he's a sophomore from St. John's College High School. And then another kid right behind him is Antoine Littleton, who dropped 50 pounds to get down to 235. Six feet, 235. And this kid had one carry against Charlotte, one carry for 59-yard touchdown. Then they got a freshman behind them, Ramon Brown, who's down from Richmond, Virginia. So all four running backs, a redshirt freshman, a sophomore, another redshirt freshman, and a true freshman. Mm -hmm. So the future is bright in that running back spot for Maryland. 
And, and that really helps the passing game because if, if Maryland can get that running game going, if Hemby can give them you know something close to that every week, you look at that receiving core that Maryland has, and it is scary. Yeah, I, you know, we, we talked about probably the strength of this football team offensively has got to be the wideouts because you've got six guys, seven guys, everyone plays, everyone has a catch, at least one catch this year. Demas has come back from the injury last year, and he's got 30 consecutive games now with at least one catch going back to last year. Jason Jones also sidelined with an ACL last year, as was Demas. So you lost those two guys three or four games into the season last year. They're back at full strength. The number one guy that was in, I think, the top ten of almost every Big Ten category in receptions was Rakim Jarrett. And these are all young guys. Uh, Jarrett is a junior from St. John's College High School, which is like a feeding ground to Washington. He's got speed. He's got elusiveness. He's got great hands. Uh, he's been the healthiest of all the guys since he's been here. Jacob Copeland comes in from Florida, and he led the Gators last year in, in receiving. And he comes to Maryland, a junior. He's still got one more year with us. Ty Felton's a young kid, a sophomore. Uh, Octavian Smith, they really like. He's a true freshman from a local high school, Pate Branch. And he also he had a 17-yard uh, touchdown run against uh, Buffalo in the first game of the year. So all all these receivers, and Talia spreads the ball around too, Mike. He doesn't he doesn't show any favorites. But it's interesting against SMU. The leading receiver out of all those guys was none of them. C.J. Dupree yeah. and Corey Deitches, the two tight ends, <laughs> were the guys that he really focused on. And Deitches led the team in receptions, and he had that touchdown with about six minutes to go that put Maryland on top finally in, a, as you mentioned, a back-and-forth game, and they were able to win the game thanks to the tight end. And who would have thought? I can't remember the last time a tight end led this team in receptions <laughs> unless it goes back to – maybe Vernon Davis's days when he was playing here. Well, you know, another positive uh, I, I would think that Maryland and Coach Loxley have to take from the game, Johnny, is uh, that the defense provided some real momentum uh, swinging plays throughout that game. Um, two picks, I think, uh, one fumble, three turnovers on downs, yeah. and forced to miss field goal. That was really huge in a, a back-and-forth game like that with the defense getting those momentum swings. Well, I think one thing the coaches are going to work on is the fact that they're giving up a lot of yardage defensively, even though they had a good game when they needed it. Despite all the penalties, they're able to beat SMU. But when you give up 520 yards to a team like SMU, we, you know they're going to score a lot. They're going to have a lot of a lot, a lot of yardage. But they're averaging, they're giving up over 500 yards, 400 yards a game uh, defensively. So you can't, you just can't do that after the SMU game. And that's been a focus that you got to have more sacks. You got to have more pressure on the quarterback. They hadn't had an interception until the SMU game when they picked off two. And last year they had a whole bunch of them and sacks have been kind of limited as well. So he's got to get, he's got to get more production, I think, from the guys up front. Uh, Greg China Rose did have a sack against SMU. Mona Silly Kite, defensive tackle. He's preseason all conference. Ami Finau, preseason all conference. Darrell Chami. All these guys are not getting the pass rush that I think uh, they want them to get or should be getting. Linebackers are solid and Cowan and Barham and Hippolyte. And the secondary is young, but boy, they are good with Banks at a corner and Bennett at a corner and Trader and Gibson and Bo Braid and, and Tar Heap Steel. So I think they're, they have to understand that if you get more, say, more pressure on the quarterbacks and, you know, the first two guys we faced were not, were good, but they weren't in that same category as the guy we just faced uh, with SMU. Uh, Mordecai, who was tremendous, transferred in from Oklahoma. So now when you go up against a team like Michigan and, and the quarterback that they have and, the fact that they were able to play seven quarterbacks against <laughs> Connecticut, that is a major concern, I think, right there. Who do you prepare for? After the game, Johnny, I was watching uh, Coach Loxley's presser, and he really had good things to say about SMU. He knew they, they were a quality opponent, and I think that was an important takeaway uh, from that game when you go 3-0, and but you, you played a really good football team and won a back-and-forth tight game. That can really pay dividends down the road, can't it? I think it can. 
And and I think, uh, but but as I mentioned, you know, the the, uh, the uh, I think they call the Michigan preseason preseason games like preseason exhibition games. You guys played, <laughs> and that's the same thing with us. When you look at the schedule, Buffalo, Charlotte, SMU. Well, that's Michigan. That's not Michigan. Michigan State and Purdue and Penn State and Wisconsin and Ohio State. They're in, in certainly a different category, a different league. So you've got. I mean, you have to you have to take everything up to the next level. And you got to keep it there. You got to cut down on the penalties, and you got to have more focus. And you know, some of these kids will be so overwhelmed, and so it'll be an eye-opening experience to go into Michigan Stadium and have a hundred thousand people watching to play football. That's what they came to Maryland to do. They came to play in the Big Ten. They came to play against the best competition in the in the in the country in the Big Ten. And when you got a hundred thousand fans, you've got a chance to really show what you can do. And I think that may be, that might be a key to what, how Maryland handles things. Mike Loxley is going to preach. I know the fact that this is such a golden opportunity. You go up against a legendary coach. You go up against a legendary university. You've got a hundred thousand people. You got the entire nation watching the game, turning the sound down, listening to you. <laughs> As he always says, it tends to be every week. <laughs> And you've got a chance to beat the number four team in the country. But if you play the way you played the first three games, not going to happen. You've got to play your best. They can probably be a little bit off on their game, and that's the great thing about college football. You never know. And I mean, you can look at the upsets we've seen this year so far from schools that have no shot, and they come away somehow, some way, with an upset, it's always good to come to Ann Arbor. Always good. The fans are tremendous. I think every player loves it. Every Maryland fan that travels there likes the atmosphere, and uh, that's what college football is all about, in my opinion. Well, it's going to be great to get Big Ten, uh, Big Ten's portion of the schedule underway, and you know, all of us that you know cover Michigan football have known this is the first big, big test uh, for Michigan, especially the defense. And you know, when I have watched Maryland the last couple of years, and then this year so far, and then Saturday night. When I watch uh, Tagovailoa, he is just such a precision quarterback, and that receiving core scares me. You've covered so many quarterbacks in your years at Maryland. Have you seen one better? Uh, yeah, I've probably seen a couple of guys better because they were record setters. When you talk about Boomer Esiason, yeah, and you talk about Scott Milanovic, those guys. But those guys are next in line for him. Uh, Talia's got nine 300 yard games. Milanovic had 10. And that's the school record set, as I told Talia last week, 27 years ago, back in 1990. He was there in 92 to 95. And he's got 39 career touchdowns. That puts him number three all time. And certainly in sight of Boomer. Boomer had 42. And Milanovic had 49. So he's 10 touchdown passes away from becoming the all time leader in that category. The thing I do like about him the most, though, Mike, as I told you, is how unselfish he is, how down-to-earth he is. And I'll tell you one interesting story. The interview I did with him last week, he never, never likes to talk about himself. So you have to stay away from that. And as you know, in talking to players, Mm -hmm. there are certain things, certain avenues you can take and certain avenues you can't take. So before we did the interview, I said, Talia, I'm going to have to bring up a couple of things about the last game and look ahead to SMU. And he said, that's fine. But I want to talk mostly about when you were growing up in Hawaii. He goes, oh, yeah, I'd like to do that. So I mentioned to him, I said, what's it like when you go home to Hawaii and you're around little kids and you're looked up, you're looked up to like you are the guy that we want to be like when we get older. We want to be like Talia. And his, his response was priceless. He said, when I go home to Hawaii, I'm just little Leah. He said, I think back to when I was these kids' ages. I grew up in Eva Beach, which is a tough part of Hawaii. And uh, it's pretty rough to come out of Eva Beach. I did it. And I think I'm maybe giving these young kids some hope that, hey, if Talia can do it, I can do it. He said, I'm with my buddies. I'm with my family. I'm with my grandparents. I'm with all the friends that I grew up with. He said, it's wonderful when I go back home to Hawaii because I'm not, I'm not a football player. 
I'm just little Lee again. And then I brought up to him, I said, now your brother, your brother last week only threw for 297 yards and only got two touchdowns. So you had four touchdowns and 397 yards. You talked to your brother about that on Sunday night in your conversation. He said, oh, no, no. <laughs> he said, I could never do that. He said, you know, I know you don't believe this, but we don't talk football. We talk about people back home. We talk about who we ran into. We talk about our parents and our grandparents. And then yesterday, on Sunday, when the, when the Miami played against the, the Ravens, I mean, Tua won that game for the Dolphins. Yeah, yeah. And Talia was there with his whole family. And his whole family was watching Talia on Saturday. Tua came to the game on Saturday night. It was reversed on Sunday. He's just a wonderful, wonderful kid that I wish everybody had the chance to sit down and talk with and visit with and see that, you know, most quarterbacks are pretty cocky. I mean, you got to be to play that position, but to see the way that he's handled his success and just, just dishes out the accolades to all of his teammates. It's very, very refreshing. And it's, it's honest too. It's mm-hmm. not, he's not putting this thing on either. That's what I've heard from everyone uh, that's ever met him. He's a class act. And I think uh, in another year or two, he's probably going to be uh, playing on Sundays with his brother. Don't you think so? I would, I would think so. I, I definitely think so. Yeah. Yeah. He does. I never even go that way with him because he would go nuts if I even mentioned yeah. that. Final question before we let you get away, Johnny. Uh, it's game week, so there's a lot going on. But as always, it's it's an honor to have you join us. So when we get ready for that Maryland matchup every year, my listeners really enjoy hearing your thoughts on the game and getting an idea of uh, of Maryland football, what's happening with them. But remind our listeners, if you will, how long it's been that you've been the radio play-by-play voice for the Terps. 44 years. Started in 1979 when Jerry Claiborne, the late Jerry Claiborne, was the head coach. And we've gone through a lot of coaches since then. Bobby <laughs> Ross and Joe Krivak and Mark Vanderlin- or Mark Duffner, Ron Vanderlinden, uh, Randy Etzel, uh, and Matt Canada, now the Pittsburgh Steelers quarterback and offensive guy. And Aaron Basis last year, Mike Loxley, and the great Ralph Friesian. So I've, I've been very fortunate, Mike, to do football and basketball 44 years. And I never, never thought it would last this long. Uh, but you kind of blink your eyes and here you are. Mm-hmm. And I've had a chance to work with some great coaches and athletic directors. And the contacts you make with players, I think that means a lot to me anyhow. That when they come back to a game to watch Maryland play, they pop up to our broadcast booth. They come inside. They haven't got a jury. On, so I don't know who I'm talking to half the time. <laughs> they give you a big bear hug and say, it's been a long time. And I say, yeah, it has been a long time. I don't know who it is. <laughs> and uh, I mean, it's, it's hysterical. But but the, the relationships you've had and uh, you know, great games. And, and uh, in fact, I think about the Michigan. You know, we've only beaten, Maryland's only beaten Michigan one time. And C.J. Brown was a quarterback. And that was a couple of years ago in 2016 or 14, 2014, I guess it was. And then C.J., Moved up to be our analyst for a couple of years until he moved down to Atlanta and then he couldn't do it anymore. But that's the only time we've been able to beat Michigan, 23-16. And it was a great crowd that day, over 100,000 people. And uh, and I enjoy coming to Ann Arbor. I enjoy seeing the fans. And and it should be a good ball game. And like, I think like every broadcaster in the country, I feel fortunate to be with an excellent school, great administration, and uh, it's been a wonderful, wonderful run. As I said, Johnny, it's a pleasure to have you on, uh, an honor to have you on uh, each year as we prepare for the Maryland game. My listeners uh, look forward to it. So as always, you are so generous with your time, and we look forward to that next visit. Thank you, Mike, and I look forward to seeing you when we come to town on Saturday. hits today at Jim's presser on Monday he addressed some injuries Cade McNamara suffered a foot injury against UConn Saturday he said it is not season ending but will take some time Carson Barnhart Nakai Hill Green and Donovan Edwards are all questionable or doubtful for this Saturday's game 
Hopefully, we'll have an update for you between now and then when we do Thursday's game day show. Thanks again to radio legend Johnny Holiday for being with us today. He is always entertaining. He's a first-class act and a pleasure to have on the show. Thursday, our guest will be beat writer Aaron McMahon from M Live. We'll have some game day notes for you, what the weather looks like on Saturday, and once again, any injury updates made available between now and then. That will do it for now. Thanks for joining me, and make sure you tell your Michigan family and friends about the show. I'm your host, Mike Fitzpatrick. Have a great Wolverine week, everyone. Until we meet again, take care, and as always, go blue. Thanks for joining us today on The Michigan Man, here on Wolverine Sports Radio, a member of the V-Sporto Network, and in partnership with SB Nation's Maze and Brew. Our listener lines are open 24-7 for your calls at 313-263-4842. That's 313-263-4842. Or email us at the Michigan Man Podcast at yahoo.com. That's the Michigan Man Podcast at yahoo.com. The Michigan Man Podcast is produced at the studios of Robin Lynn Productions, Allen Park, Michigan, and is not affiliated with the University of Michigan. Go Blue!